Um, let me introduce our panellists. We've got a great range of expertise here today. So to my right, we have James EPMP for Wells. Um, to his right, we have Simon Farman, Director of Safety and Network Strategy for Cadent. To my left, we have Jen Baxter, who's the Head of Engineering at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. And finally, we have Mike Muldoon, who is the Head of Business Development and Marketing at Alstrom. So, to, turning to today's event, I think it's, it's increasingly difficult for people to uh, not be aware of how hydrogen has crept back into the discourse for trans transitioning to a low carbon economy. The UK set ambitious decarbonisation targets of 80% by 2050. And in order to do so, we need to overcome some of the many challenges that uh, this transition brings, namely how do we decarbonise hard to reach sectors, transport industry, um, how do we integrate variable, um, increasing amounts of variable renewable energy, and here power to gas has potential to solve some of those intermittency problems. Yet the pace of decarbonisation has been particularly slow in the transport sector where emissions have stayed largely static, uh, and industry the, uh, emissions actually increased last year. So this is where hydrogen has potential. Also, some form of gas is, is almost certainly needed to meet winter peaks. Seasonal storage from batteries is probably uh, a bit of a stretch at the moment. So it's certainly my view that gas has some form of role to play, but the question is what kind of gas that is. Is it hydrogen? Is it natural gas? And if so, where does CCUS fit into this picture? At a high level, the two big challenges that need to become overcome in, if we are to use more hydrogen in the economy First, we need to look at how to uh, scale uh, sustainably produced hydrogen. And this goes back to the, the session we had earlier this morning around CCS. If we are really to, to, to produce large amounts of hydrogen, CCS is almost certainly going to play a pivotal role in that. And secondly is where best to use hydrogen within this system. The various uses of um, production methods are very interlinked. So we need to take a whole systems approach to hydrogen to, to determine where best uh, needs to be uh, used. Um, the concept of a hydrogen economy is not new. It's been going around for a number of years. Um, and although we might not this, um, eventually move towards a full hydrogen economy, there's certainly some merits and um, some huge opportunities for uh, producing hydrogen and looking where it can be best used in the system um, to overcome the challenges the UK faces when transitioning to a low carbon economy. So with that, I'll hand over to James for his thoughts. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to sit on this panel and to talk about uh, hydrogen um, once again to be um, with Hynet as well, who I know um, do some wonderful work in this area and I think are sort of leading the way. Um, talking of leading the way, um, Josh's effort here is the second best report um, to published that, actually, on, uh, on, on hydrogen <laughs> in the last year or so. The best uh, was done by me and Alan Whitehead uh, for, um, for Carbon Connect, which you can read. We're on the set. We've just completed the second of a three-part go at looking at how hydrogen might be employed. But what's important there is that I think across the sort of um, the, the clean energy bubble, and unfortunately it is still within that bubble, I'm not sure we've yet reached the consciousness of those beyond, but increasingly, there is a discussion around hydrogen, which I think was sort of not quite as vivid as it, what is, as it is now, as it was sort of, um, sorry, is much more vivid now than it was um, two years ago. Um, why are people going back in the direction of, of hydrogen? Well, I think, you know, yes, we've made lots and lots of uh, great strides forward uh, with decarbonising power, but we've still not yet sorted that conundrum of what to how we deliver dispatchable power when the renewables fleet fails um, which you know that's not a that's not a criticism of renewables it's just a reality of how renewables work that there will be times when the wind isn't blowing or, and the sun isn't shining uh, and therefore there needs to be something else and I think that hydrogen uh, as a method of producing power in those circumstances is something we should be looking at very seriously. Where it is much more applicable is in, uh, much more immediately applicable is in heat and transport. Um, and I'll come on to talk about those in, in, in more detail um, shortly. Um, I think what is particularly important about this debate is that to talk about gas is in no way sort of 
backward looking. It's not, you know, it do, you don't have to just be talking about electricity and battery storage in order to be on message when it comes to clean tech and clean growth. Um, we have got beneath us a gas network that we have spent billions and billions of pounds developing over many decades. And to just throw all of that away because we have wedded ourselves to this idea of an entirely electrical future makes no sense. And the sort of work that we've been doing in the Carbon Connect reports and, and, and the stuff that Policy Exchange and others have been doing um, has identified that there are real opportunities employing, in employing the current gas infrastructure as a hydrogen infrastructure in the future with huge savings to the taxpayer because you're not having to re, re, rebuild, renew uh, infrastructure. You can simply use what is already there. So too does this make a lot of sense for those in heavy industry in particular for whom, you know, when you're looking at this from a sort of domestic or small business perspective, it's really easy to say, well, I'm going to get an EV or I'm going to make all my delivery vans electric. I'm going to put some solar panels on my roof. I'm going to put some batteries under the eaves. I'm going to put a wind, part, um, a wind turbine outside. And that all makes sense if, if your business is up to a certain size. But if you are doing big, big, heavy manufacturing, very often there's no escaping that you need that sort of thermal um, energy that comes from burning a gas and hydrogen clearly is very relevant there. Um, where I think that we have an even uh, a, a particularly big opportunity with hydrogen is that I don't think that anybody anywhere is yet doing this at a scale that really demonstrates the concept. And so actually what is happening in the UK is already world leading and will show that a hydrogen economy brings with it thousands of jobs, m millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment. And crucially, it is proving technologies that are exportable the world over and in which many countries around the world um, are, showing, uh, real, uh, are showing real enthusiasm for. Um, but we must commit to demonstrating it at scale, which is why it's so important that we support the high net um, project uh, and others that come forward because uh, sort of my penultimate um, point it's not really a whinge at government but it is it is a reality that we're very good I think at having the idea we're very very good at encouraging companies to go into that space and sort of develop things we're very good at funding them through those early stages but what we've not yet figured out how to do is to concentrate those technologies into a place and then resource them to be deployed at scale to prove the concept in a really meaningful way. Now, that doesn't actually just apply to hydrogen. That applies to all sorts of clean technologies and also smart city IoT technologies that if they all were proven to work together in the way that I'm sure that they could, would be world leading and I think would create huge opportunities and I hope um, I've been sort of talking about a test town now for a, a few months. I know that uh, HiNet is already committed to, um, to the Northwest, and I, I, they will prove that at scale. But if we could have a test town or a series of test towns in which we go for this, all of it, the whole sort of deployment of clean tech and all the smart city stuff that comes with it, we could, I think, do something really very, very clever indeed. The final thing that hydrogen really unlocks is carbon capture and storage, which um, I, I think actually the previous chancellor was right to delete that from the agenda given the cost that it was going to bring to the UK taxpayer. Um, but that did come with significant cost, both in terms of carbon but also in terms of innovation because all the signal to industry was that carbon capture and storage is, is not on the table anymore. If you can reframe carbon capture and storage as a byproduct of the process of producing hydrogen, then I think carbon capture and storage becomes much more palatable from a sort of political perspective. Um, I know that in Holland, I, I think it is Holland that the, the Statoil are doing, is that right? Yeah, there's, a, there's a power station where they're bringing gas out of the North Sea. They're um, pre-combustion, taking the carbon off the top of the gas, sending that back out to sea in a carbon capture and storage um, capacity, and then using the hydrogen to, to generate power. And then when you look at how they're pitching that to government, they're pitching it simply in terms of how much it costs to produce a megawatt hour of energy, rather than how much it costs to capture storage. So if we can start to see 
CCS as a part of a mechanism for producing hydrogen and we wrap the costs up as that, rather than saying here is just a cost to capture storage under the sea, I think it becomes uh, a much more compelling argument. Um, with that, I will shut up because my time is up, um, but I look forward to taking your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, I'll now hand over to Simon Farman. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. So who's Cadence? Cadence is a new name. We've got 200 years of history. We own and operate four of the UK's eight gas distribution networks. So we bring gas to your homes. Uh, we go from the northwest right way down to the wash. We go across to Wales. We cover London. We cover a big chunk of the UK. And we've got a lot of infrastructure there providing energy for business and our homes. Just to reflect for a moment um, of the energy we su supply each year, about a third goes to industry, about a third is used for heating our homes, and a third is in power generation, so the times when the wind's not blowing and we need to top up the grid. We also offer a huge amount of flexibility across that network with storage and a really big swing between what happens in the summer and what happens in the winter. And if we just think about that for a moment, um, we're really good at knowing how long time is, how far distance is. But energy, we all get a little bit. The numbers are either vast or we can't sort of bring them into context. So for me at home, winter's day, I'd probably use about 20 um, kilowatt hours of electricity. The electricity boys say that's quite a lot. The kids use a lot of electricity at home. So 20 kilowatts of electricity to heat the home. Uh, about 100 kilowatts of gas used. So that's about five times as much, and that's pretty consistent across the UK, four times as much energy going through the gas grid as electricity. Yesterday I needed to fill my car up with petrol, put 50 litres in the tank in that three minutes at the petrol station, and put 500 kilowatts of energy into my car. And then you start to get the scale of these different numbers because they're then all in kilowatts. So, you know, enough petrol in my car to heat my home for nearly a week, 20 days worth of electricity. OK, the numbers don't translate exactly because of efficiency, but we have huge amounts of energy delivered to us as users at home without really thinking about the quantities that are there. So we need to think about decarbonising heat and industry uh, with an eye on what also we could do for transport. So we are actively pursuing the research, the technology, the support that would allow us to deliver 100% hydrogen for industry, to deliver a blend of hydrogen and natural gas to homes to start the decarbonisation process, and then to see what we could do to deliver hydrogen for trains, uh, for transport, for HGV, for taxis, buses, ferries, you name it. Um, we need to look at how we could deliver hydrogen for those hard to get at transport uh, carbon emitters. We've also got our existing infrastructure and you know, again as James said we are investing huge amounts of money each year across the gas industry about a billion pounds in replacing our old iron pipes with plastic. By 2032 90% of the network will be plastic, the pipes in the streets. So there's a real drive uh, that we've been doing there. That gives us two benefits. You know, that gives us a great um, network for the future and something we need to be mindful of and also make sure that we're safe. The, this comes together for us across our Northwest network. We've got a really good mix of industry and uh, homes, and that means that we could build a hydrogen network across the Northwest. So it would be hydrogen for industry, move them and convert them to 100% of 100% of, uh, hydrogen. Um, homes blended at up to a 20% blend and then we would make the hydrogen from methane and use carbon capture and storage to put that into the Liverpool Bay where there are existing oil and gas reservoirs that are reaching the end of their operational life. So we've got a project. Um, if we say it quickly, we estimate about a billion pounds. So just under a billion pounds, it gives high quality jobs to the northwest. It moves industry from being carbon emitters to zero carbon. Potential to keep the UK's jobs in the UK rather than exporting jobs that create carbon. It gives us a clear strategy for other industries coming to the northwest and the ability for us to extend that to resolve some of the transport issues to help us clean the air of Manchester and Liverpool city regions. 
you know, we are seeking um, to encourage government, I would say, because these things do cost money, to do this at scale and do it quickly. There is no point in waiting to 2030. We need to start moving these things now. We need these things up and running at scale by 2025. The other distribution networks are looking at alternatives and we absolutely support those. So how do we get there? Well, we've run Kiel University on a blended grid. So we've run 20% hydrogen into Kiel University. We're looking to move that now to a permanently running 20% blend rather than just a test. We've got projects looking at hydrogen for transport. We've got projects looking at hydrogen 100% and how does the gas grid operate with that. You know, we see absolute leadership in decarbonising. We see the efficiencies and benefits of having a clear roadmap with government about where do we go. We've seen fantastic performance in the wind, offshore wind, in driving costs down by having certainty and auctions. And we see similar solutions could help make this affordable and effective for customers. And, you know, this gives the UK a tremendous competitive advantage in the world outside where other countries are also looking to move to a hydrogen economy. And it gives that whole backbone across the UK with solutions for Birmingham, solutions for London, um, which is good. The real question that always comes back in these sessions is where does the hydrogen come from? So let's be honest about that. Initially it has to come from methane, um, cracking methane and putting the carbon uh, back into the uh, reservoirs. We have projects in Swindon looking at taking black bag waste, the stuff we get rid of every day, um, and turning that into hydrogen and methane. Um, we estimate that if you took the black bag waste from Birmingham, it would provide enough energy to heat Coventry. So we are talking 30% of 30% uh, of the UK's heat could come from black bag waste. Um, then we look beyond that to what we do with electrolysis, so breaking down water into hydrogen and um, oxygen, and we need a bit more research in those spaces. But there's three good sections of technology that could do it. We also inject into our grid a lot of biomethane, so we take farm waste, farm waste, I mean converted that through anaerobic digestion into methane. There's no reason why that couldn't be uh, grown into producing hydrogen. So we've got routes for hydrogen, we've got a clear pathway for the northwest. we continue to develop similar pathways for London and for Birmingham. But right now we can see a solution and we would like to move that forward, but we need support from the government and all the things that James was talking to make this happen. Thank you. Jem. Hi, I'm Jen Baxter. I'm Head of Engineering at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and we represent 120,000 engineers globally, uh, many of whom, thousands of them, work across the energy sectors. Um, and when we talk about energy sectors, I'm talking about power, I'm talking about heat, transport, and I'm also talking about industry. And I think we've heard quite a lot already about the potential pathways for hydrogen, the opportunities that that presents going into the future. But actually, one area that I think we need to talk about more is how we produce hydrogen now and where it's used currently. So if we think about what we're doing today and where hydrogen is being used, we know that the majority of it is used for petrol refining, ammonia production, and across the manufacturing industry. So this is in the metals industries, in the food industries, and other areas. The amount that's currently used for energy production and in transport is probably less than 1%. So we know that most of where we use it are areas that we're not really talking about at the moment. And so that brings us to how do we make it? And there are three main ways that hydrogen is made. And I'll come back to electrolysis in a moment because it's actually the smallest amount. But the three main ways are steam methane reforming without carbon capture and storage. So that's breaking down methane partial oil oxidation, which uses a sort of similar approach, and coal gasification. So this is all fossil fuel use to produce hydrogen. And this is what we call the production of brown hydrogen. So this is an area where we can really afford to decarbonize and where we can actually find some space to do some industrial decarbonization. So the 4% is produced from electrolysis. Now that's the um, taking a part of water using an electrical current where you create hydrogen and then you also have oxygen. And this is an area where we haven't really done any 
sort of research recently. There's a little bit going on, but there's actually an opportunity to really transform this industry to produce more. And the reason this is important is it gives us a connection to other energy industries. It gives us primarily a connection to the power industry. So where we have nuclear power, where we have renewables, where there are opportunities to start to use our decarbonized energy system to actually use and create more decarbonized energy, this is where the potential is. So we need to see a real growth in there. And by transforming those markets today, the ones where we use hydrogen now, gives us an opportunity to develop markets for tomorrow. And those are for the areas that people have mentioned on the panel already. So I think what I would really like to say is that from an engineering point of view and from a decarbonization point of view, let's focus on how we can make changes now for what we can do tomorrow rather than thinking about tomorrow before we've cracked what we're doing today. Thank you. Mike. Right, okay, so a little bit about Alstom. Alstom is a, a rail system supplier. We produce all aspects of rail systems, uh, and that includes the trains, the track, the electrification, all those kind of things. And one of our recent innovations is the production of the world's first hydrogen fuel cell powered train. Two of those trains are now in passenger service in Germany. Uh, they're fully approved for passenger use. Um, and I think we're just starting the process there to, um, I think the, the phrase was to expand the consciousness of those beyond, trying to normalize the use of hydrogen in, in, the, in the expectations of people so that they're used to uh, the type of products that hydrogen can create. Um, and fundamentally, um, what that train will do is, is, is lead to the deployment of the world's first full fleet. So there'll be 14 trains operating in Germany. So that, from our point of view, is, is, a, is a key milestone. But of course, we then need to look at how we can use that and what we can do with that in the UK. Um, and Alstom in the UK is dealing with a different set of parameters, not least the physical parameters of the railway. And so here in this country, we have our own facilities for design, for development and manufacture. Um, and what we are doing is developing what will hopefully be the world's first uh, current train conversion to hydrogen power. Uh, working with partners um, in, the, in the industry, uh, we've chosen a particular railway train fleet called the Class 321, which is owned by a company called Eversholt. I won't go into all the background on that. But fundamentally, it's a regular train that you may have seen if any of you have travelled in East Anglia. Uh, you've probably been on it. Um, and it will be converted to hydrogen power and able to be deployed around the country um, wherever there is uh, a need. So what is the need for hydrogen trains? Why would we want to use them, hydrogen transport generally? Really, clearly, we're trying to decarbonise across the piece. The rail industry is a key uh, player in that environment. We're not one of the biggest emitters, but we are part of the biggest emitting sector now in transport, and we need to do our bit. So the trains become zero emission at point of use. There's just steam and water emitted from them, a new steam age, if you like. Um, and what that gives us is then the opportunity to replace some of the older, more polluting diesel trains that we see around the country. There's quite a lot of networks in this country that were never planned to be electrified. There was never a purpose to electrifying those routes and there was no commercial model on which you'd do it uh, other than that of, of paying a lot of money for little return. So those are, that's why we have so many diesel trains, the second largest fleet in Europe. Um, and that's why we need to find solutions that are actually uh, uh, far better performing than the current solutions that we have. So in, in replacing those regional train fleets, which they tend to be. We're not talking about replacing high-speed, high-intensity fleets. There's very clear business and technical logic to keeping those electrified. But the regional networks are, are ideal for the implementation of um, hydrogen trains. And interestingly, that fits very well with the model of clustered uh, development or with the model of even test towns, because Wherever you put a hydrogen fleet, you create a demand for hydrogen. Um, and normally, uh, when we think of transport, we all think of cars. It's what we do automatically. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of etched into us these days. But actually, 
investing for car fuel at the moment is very much a question of where's the demand, where's the supply, and, and that's why we see a slower rollout of hydrogen vehicles than we do electric, probably, because we've all embraced electric in a, in a more direct manner. A rail application, we work to timetables. I know that's sometimes a sensitive issue, but fundamentally, rail operates to timetables over many years, generating a consistent, repeated demand. That helps with the investment and with the um, development of the facilities to supply and distribute the hydrogen. We can then lead that. Our, our facility can become a, a hub for uh, other transport modes as well. So if you're fueling trains with tons of hydrogen every day, you can readily supply kilograms of hydrogen at the same point to feed other modes of transport and other users. And in that way, we feel that we can play a role in helping to spread what would be a growing network of hydrogen around the country. Uh, and I think that's, that's really Alstom's vision for what we can do in terms of hydrogen for the UK. Brilliant. Thank you. So a number of our panellists have alluded to the fact that we need to not just scale up um, hydrogen production, but do so in a clean way and lower the cost of production, both through CCUS or through electrolysis. And production via both those methods is at least 1.5 or two times as expensive conventional natural gas. So my question to you, James, and, and the other panellists, what are the policy levers that government could pull to lower the cost of sustainable production and scale that up? I, mean, I think that the, the, the obvious thing to do um, is to look at how we do R&D funding, which at the moment I think is significant but quite piecemeal. And if we were able to bring together R&D funding into sort of one concerted place where you say we're just going to really go for this at scale and prove the concept I think that's the biggest lever of all that government could pull um, we're sort of and I know there's a charge that if you were to do that you'd be putting all of your eggs in one basket and you're also not spreading the love and you know, it, 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 clearly I would want the test town for the United Kingdom to be I don't know Wells, um, but um, but the reality is is that it won't be, you know it, it won't be Wells. It won't be. It might not even be in the southwest. So, am I comfortable with government's R and D funding being concentrated geographically when politically that's quite challenging because it means that companies in my area might not get um, as much of a slice of the pie. But that is very obviously the, the biggest lever of all to pull. The other thing that I think government needs to be much much better at is just selling the vision of all of this. Because I don't think we have anywhere near, uh, we're nowhere near to having the consent of the consumer to start to do this transition. Um, because it does come with disruption. It might come with additional cost in the short term. And we could be imaginative about how we try and balance that out. And I don't just mean the private, I mean business as well. And if we're not, if we can't find a way of being much bolder, much more... Um, compelling in the way that we sell this to both the private and the business user it will always stall uh, this you know just uh, think of me josh i'm going to go off on one for, for 30 seconds but what is the role of hydrogen in a decarbonized world what well, you know in greg's speech in greg's thing earlier on as brilliant as that was there was no real discussion of clean growth at all Chris Grayling in the transport speech immediately before it did mention climate change and did a really good section on clean growth but in the hall it wasn't really reacted to there's no there's no buzz about it that and that's no reflection of what was said it's just a reality of that we're not yet from a party political perspective we're not yet bringing our people on this journey i think i probably know a third of the people in this room who have just come up from london where we do these sorts of meetings all the time and you've just come up to check that when we're amongst our own tribe we say the same up here as we do when we're down in london speaking to you guys so how do we sort of make this just that bit more mainstream to infuse people, our own people first, then the, the country beyond, about what it is that needs to happen? Because until there's that groundswell of support, that urging of, well, actually, I do want a hydrogen-powered railway. Actually, I do want to get an electric car, or I want a hydrogen 
um, fuel-celled car. Actually, I do want to look at what the low-carbon or zero-carbon heating options are for my home, and I don't just want to do that because I'm guilty about climate change. I want to do that because I see an opportunity to heat my home or go about my daily life in a more cheaper, in a cheaper cost-effective way. Unless we can start to fire that, it just won't really happen. What happened? You know, all the stuff from Liverpool last week about this was just jingoism. It was just it was it was about guilt-based tackling climate change. It wasn't about the economic, the technological, the industrial case for doing this stuff. Because if, if high net works, it will transform industry in the northwest and will make heavy engineering, heavy manufacturing viable again in a low carbon developed economy. This is the vision we should be selling, and that arguably it's not necessarily a policy lever, but it's probably the biggest job that government's got to do. Thank you for indulging me. No, <laughs> I'll leave. Any of our other panelists want to come in on that? I'll just. Uh, I think there's also a connection. We talk about decarbonising and climate change a lot, and they're quite. Um, nebulous concepts, they're very difficult to get a handle on, but actually a lot of this is about people's health. So decarbonisation and cleaning the fuels that we use is about air quality. It's about improving the air quality in our cities. Now we've got a, um, a new, very short report called Snappily titled Trains, Engines and Fuels, um, and that really talks a lot about how we can actually start to decarbonise trains. And in industrial areas um, and in cities, we have trains that are idling using diesel engines within enclosed stations, which, as you can imagine, is a huge pollution problem. And it has a major impact on the health of the people who work in those stations. So uh, when we put trains through urban city areas that run on diesel, they are also having the same impact as putting loads of HGVs through those areas. So this is actually about health. And I think if... We can begin to help everybody, whether they are politicians or whether they're anybody else, to understand the connection between improving our environment, improving our health and our opportunities to continue to be able to use our soil, our water and breathe our air. That is actually how we start to transform and begin to bring about more clean growth. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I think I'd echo many of those comments. I think it's very much about... I mentioned normalising the use of a hydrogen train. I think we have to normalise the concept that decarbonisation, that, that the, this, this step forward is, is just what everyone's going to do, that that's where we're going. Um, if, we, if we keep making exceptions or if we have inconsistencies across policies and sectors, we'll start to look like it's a little bit opportunistic. If, if it looks strategic and it feels strategic, it probably is strategic. Thank you. Yeah, I think for me, Josh, the... Um, the technology that's used to make uh, fertilisers takes methane and already creates hydrogen, so the technology is there. Cadent, as a company, is good at piping gas or an energy from uh, the production through to the people's homes and businesses, and we see real value in that. Carbon capture and storage is there. We just need clarity from government and the regulators where it's regulated, likewise backing that, and these things can happen at pace. Thank you. Simon, you mentioned that Cadent are doing... 20% blending in, in Leeds, and I was wondering some of the, the work that we've done and, and others indicates that a 20% blend is a good starting point mm -hmm. for decarbonisation, but if you want to go further, you need to get to 100%. So I'm wondering how possible is it to get to 100% in a liberalised market, given the last conversion from town gas was done under a, a nationalised industry, and it's sort of been dubbed the Corbyn option within government. How... How possible do you think that is? So I think for me, um, industry is where the first point of call is. Let's get them onto 100% hydrogen. Let's sort out the manufacturing in a zero uh, carbon world. So I think they are heavy industry first. We have done all the tests and it's safe to put a 20% blend into people's homes and there's no need to change anything. So your existing appliances work perfectly safely. So actually you can do 20% hydrogen blend I'm going to say for free, but obviously the hydro has to come from somewhere, so that there is no need to visit customers. Beyond that, I think we need to look 2040 to 2050 timescale and get the manufacturers on board who make the appliances, and we can go some way on the journey to the digital TV switchover, where you buy a new television or you buy a new boiler, and it will work right the way through the range. Um, Right now, uh, that is the bit of research that needs to be done. That's what we need to support, and we're actively talking to appliance manufacturers and saying, you know, where are you going in this space? 
Uh, for us, our boundary stops at where the emergency control valve, the gas meter is, but we need the regulators, I think, to look at energy in total rather than looking at gas and electricity separately to get the right low-cost outcome for customers. Thank you. I think there's probably broad consensus that hydrogen presents regional opportunities, particularly in the northwest, uh, particularly in Scotland. Um, is it possible to reconcile that with mass adoption acceptance and normalisation? Um, can I answer this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think this may be slightly uh, different view to some of the people on this panel, but I don't think that hydrogen necessarily needs to be a mass adopted energy solution. Um, the future energy system that will be low carbon will be made up of lots of different types of technologies and those may be suitable for different regions. So hydrogen and industry go together really well. Industry makes hydrogen, hydrogen can make industry. From that you can begin to sprawl a little bit and support the trains that run in the areas of that industry. You can support the bus links that run in that industry. It's very likely that small passenger vehicles and small light vehicles will be supported by batteries and not by hydrogen. So you'll be looking at a different system in city centres. Uh, it's also very possible that even the power systems for different regions will have uh, different uses. There'll be nuclear in some areas supporting centralised systems, there'll be decentralised systems elsewhere. So we have to not be so fixated on that it's one size will support the whole of the country, but actually by doing it in the way that the regions can support and what's best for those different regions will actually give us a low carbon system faster. Uh, and so that mm. is really all I'd say rather than one size fits all. Sure. Anybody else want to come in on that? I, th I think uh, you know, if we go back in time, uh, looking around the room, some of us will remember the conversion from town's gas to natural gas. Um, hydrogen really is town's gas. A big proportion of the, the town's gas we made in the past was hydrogen, so we've been there, and we just need to remind people that's where it was before we went to the clean North Sea gas. I, so I think that it's a really, really well-made point that if the cost of going for hydrogen is such that it's where you've got to, you know, government waste has put all of its infrastructure investment money from an energy perspective into hydrogen. Hydrogen clearly won't win. This has to be a proposition that says, look, this is how you use the existing gas network and this is how you produce hydrogen that can sit alongside everything that needs to be done to digitise the energy system uh, you know, and to make sure that the, electric, the electricity distribution networks are getting the investment that they need. Now, those are two very, very significant infrastructure investments, and the problem is that neither of those investments are particularly vote winners. Compared to broadband, or better roads, or better railways, or more airport capacity, those networks you know, doing gas and electricity are not the sorts of things that you put on the front of an election leaflet and have people patting you on the back when they see you on the high street for, being, for putting all of that investment in. So that's, that's a real challenge about just making sure that this is presented as a cost that's affordable alongside all of the other infrastructure renewal. The other thing that I think we need to be much smarter on is that when we achieve, as, as I'm sure that HiNet will do, a sort of cluster of hydrogen using uh, energy intensive industries, that we, we are ruthless at looking at what else can spin off from that concentration of heavy industry. So is it, should we be saying that we've got all these businesses that are now using hydrogen to manufacture and that all of their waste heat is going to be put into heat networks in the immediate vicinity as well. So there's sort of joined up thinking beyond the initial use of the hydrogen, because then you can start to aggregate the cost of producing the hydrogen, not just against the cost for those businesses in terms of their energy needs, but in terms of what it can do to reduce energy costs for all of those living nearby as well. And when you see that sort of joined up feeling, and we're, we are sitting right above such an example here, where buried down underneath the library, there's a combined heat and power plant. There are a number of others around the city centre of Birmingham that are producing heat uh, and electricity, sorry, heat for the hotels and businesses along Broad Street, which is a commercial venture, but they also produce heat into heat networks for the social housing immediately behind, which is a sort of social good. And I think, and, you know, and on the whole, what that does for the energy, the cost of energy for both business and private user in inner city Birmingham is quite impressive. And if we can start to make those synergies and join that up, 
all of a sudden the costs become much less terrifying and therefore quite eye-catching for government. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the other aspect from our point of view, I mentioned earlier about levels of demand and assured demand and what that can facilitate in terms of investment. And Jennifer touched very briefly on, on one form of technology that we haven't discussed further, which is electrolysis, um, which also offers some options in terms of the production of hydrogen. It's a, it's, depending on the nature of the electricity you use, it can be a completely zero carbon process to produce the hydrogen. Um, and, and that also may be a technology that lends itself to local deployments um, driven by things like the deployment of a transport fleet or a transport infrastructure in that area. So I think that, that there's, a, there's a sort of an extra dimension there that we get, which, which is an aside and, 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 and helps proliferate the, the, the usage more widely. But I totally accept that um, we don't see it as a, as a silver bullet or a golden bullet for the, for the rail system. I can't imagine it's, it's going to be the bullet for the entire energy system either, but it has a key part to play. Thank you. Just one thing before I open to questions. James, I think it was interesting you talked about um, how it's not necessarily a vote-winning uh, mandate, but it was quite interesting. We had the CCUS talk this morning, um, and it, I think it was Phil from Sandbag flagged up that um, Ben Hoochin and Simon Clark, they, the uh, they won, a, won a seat on a platform campaigning for CCUS and you know, a hydrogen regional economy, a regional hydrogen economy in that area. So, I, I think there are some opportunities there. It can, it, it can certainly be a, um, you know, a vote-winning process. Um, you know, as Ben and Simon have, have indicated, um, I thought that was quite an interesting point coming out of the CCUS uh, topic this morning. Um, but they pitch it not. I mean, they, they pitch it as an industrial opportunity sure. for the northeast rather than as a sort of an energy system opportunity. The sort of the, the decarbonisation is secondary in importance to the jobs that it creates and the investment it brings in in their area. Just as arguably, you know, whether you're pro or whether you're for or against nuclear, it's pretty hard to argue against what Hinkley does for us down in Somerset in terms of job creation uh, and, and investment. So um, I, 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 Simon and Ben are, are great advocates of this, but it's important to recognise that th they're making a case around investment in their area rather than... You know, this being a really sure. important part of our infrastructure development. Sure. We've got just over 15 minutes for Q&A, so if you could state your name and organisation, take the lady uh, over there, uh, and the lady behind, and then the gentleman uh, at the back. Yeah, can I just say that we all want to do stuff to make the environment cleaner. We all do, but we can't do it. The government has to do it. You know, I've got a Prius, what else can we do? You know, we can't make trains non-diesel. That's not our job. Please help us. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one first? Uh, well, we are. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? In terms of trains, we'll, we'll, um, we'll produce them just as fast and rapidly as we, as we can find places that want them. So uh, you're sort of right in that the big ticket stuff government has to do. Government is going, I wish government wasn't quite so important in the process of commissioning power stations, but it is. Uh, and big decisions over what sort of trains run is clearly government. Big decisions over what sort of, what fuels our aeroplanes are clearly things for the government. But what gets lost, and we're going off hydrogen here, but it, it, what gets lost in this debate so much is that the biggest thing, the biggest change that we could make in terms of decarbonising uh, heating, decarbonising uh, uh, use of electricity, is by insulating our homes properly, is by putting in place sort of um, more efficient appliances within our homes. And yes, there is an unable to pay part of that market where government has to step in in social housing. But actually, far too many of us are sort of well, no, 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 none of this stuff is not that the, the lady from the, uh, for, I, I've forgotten the name of the organization. Sustainable Energy Association. Sustainable Energy Association. There we are, nodding aggressively behind. You know, there, is, there are tiny, tiny things that we can all do within our homes that are relatively inexpensive, that add up within our own homes to deliver a saving far greater than we've just spent hour after hour debating in Parliament in order to price cap for, save, £75. You can save three times that 
by, by taking small energy efficient, by doing small energy efficiency measures in your home, and then aggregate that over the entire population, all the businesses, it would make a bigger saving than just about anything else that we'll be talking about here this week. And yet, annoyingly, it is the part of the energy agenda that too often slips out of the debate because people are drawn to the big infrastructure stuff first. Thank you. Lady at the back. Hi. Well, I was going to ask a question, but I'd just like to say I totally agree with everything James has just said. I mean, it's the first fuel, energy efficiency, and um, all of the events seem to be about generation and what fuel supply, but we need to talk about demand a bit more. But my question was really, um, hydrogen, I think, is a role to play. One of Some of my members do hydrogen um, fuel cells for heating. Um, there's a hydrogen hub in Swindon. There's, there's lots of this going on, which is great. But I'm, my concern and my question is, how do we ensure that we don't just end up with sort of gas by default because of the fact that the people who are playing a large part in the debate are people who sort of own the network, people who um, are gas distribution companies. The main people who are engaging in this debate, as you said, consumers don't care about and are interested in it, are the people who have a sort of interest in going in a particular direction. So if we're going to do tests on hydrogen, great. Can we do tests on other things as well, but please? Electrification, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, it is a really good point. And uh, one of the things that I, I should have said is that when we talk about brown hydrogen and the production of hydrogen from fossil fuels, we want to move away from that almost completely to the production of hydrogen from green sources, which is primarily through electrolysis. Because even as you find with greater um, penetration of renewable power, you need gas to back it up at the moment. And the same thing happens that if we put CCUS in as our solution to make hydrogen, you lock yourself into a gas system. So if we want to do it and we want to do it sustainably from the start, we have to look at solutions that ultimately remove all fossil fuels from our energy systems in the end. And the end being quite far away. So I think um, we have to be realistic about how long fossil fuels will be part of the energy system for, but the ultimate goal is to remove them entirely. Yeah, and I think for me, a um, couple of things, we need the lowest cost solution for customers. It doesn't matter if it's electricity or whether it's gas, it needs to be the lowest cost solution. We need to do these things at scale. Uh, my colleague and uh, Chris Clark from Wales and the West Utilities has run the Project Freedom, which is the combined heat pump and gas-fired boiler, so it mixes a heat pump and gas boiler. Had some great success in his networks with that and he's absolutely promoting it. And we see different solutions for different parts of the country, but the bottom line is we need to know at scale what the true cost will be for the customer rather than sitting on theoretical papers where everybody has the right answer here. Thank you. Can I come in? Uh, I, I, all I'd say, I, I think that, that, that we've been set our role in this, we've been set a technical challenge to achieve. So we've been asked to find a, met a means of decarbonising the rail industry. Um, that will stretch beyond just the rail vehicles into the, how the stations are lit, into how we, the entire energy system of the railways. But, but our particular interest in this instance has been in the vehicles. And at the moment, hydrogen is the most appropriate technology. That doesn't mean it will be forever. Um, and it doesn't mean it's probably the only one. But certainly batteries for heavy duty applications like rail and freight are not really suitable, um, and uh, that's why we're talking about, about hydrogen. Um, that doesn't mean it's, a, it's, it's the end of the story, but it's, it's the first step towards achieving the critical objective that we've been set. And government in the UK has made very clear what they would like to see in the rail industry, decarbonised by 2040, no more diesel. So we have, we have to crack on. Thank you. Gentleman at the back. I just want to raise a point. James brought up the voter buy-in and the consent of the electorate um, to this whole process. Um, unlike the lady over there, I, I don't drive a Prius. I drive a 2016 diesel Kia Karens. It's a newer diesel. It's a, a very efficient diesel, but it's still a diesel. Now, a Prius or an electric car is completely unsuitable for me. I do over 25,000 miles a year across three motorways every single day, back and forth. I can't use an electric car that takes 12 hours to charge. I, I need... Um, a, a cleaner car in the future, I do need something that actually will replace the diesel in the future. But the electric car, which is what everyone is talking about as the big thing, is not appropriate for me at all. Now, in terms of voter buy-in uh, buy and consent to the electorate, if there were the opportunity to have a hydrogen fuel cell car, 
where the process is so much easier. Plug it in, it takes 30 seconds longer than filling up a diesel car does. I'd switch to that. I'd happily go for that. I know I have to stop using diesel at some point, but until I have a viable alternative, I'm going to keep driving the diesel. So voter buy-in, give me an option. Give me hydrogen fuel cells, a possibility to replace my diesel, and I'll switch to it. That's your buy-in, surely. Thank you. So, oh, go on. No, go on, if you want to, McNulty. I mean, was there a question in there specifically? Or I'll, or I'll, <laughs> no, that's unfair. There was okay. a really good question in there. A statement more than a question. No, Josh. A good one, but a, but a statement. Um, next clutch, the gentleman there in the glasses, another gentleman in the glasses, um, and then the gentleman at the back. Thank you, Josh. Um, David Dundas, I'm an energy consultant. Um, I'd like to take issue with James about the fact that he feels that the UK is leading. I think that we're complacent, and I think that's our major problem. We have to stop our complacency and look to other countries. If you look at Germany, for example, the gentleman's talking about hydrogen-powered cars. There are over 50 active hydrogen filling stations on the German road network today. You can buy a whole variety of hydrogen-powered cars there. In Germany as well, Alsom actually has secured a contract to supply one of the German states with 14 complete hydrogen-powered trains carriages the whole lot so he's been very modest over there by not mentioning this but the fact is the technology is out there so I don't agree that we have to focus on putting our money into research all we have to do is pick up the existing technology and move with it thank you gentlemen in the glasses a question please uh, John Broderick from the University of Manchester um, it's it's quite clear from the uh, climate science and the carbon budgets that we need to be moving to a net zero uh, carbon economy, uh, then this question kind of remains about uh, hydrogen's carbon credentials. Uh, when do you see zero carbon hydrogen becoming the norm and what needs to happen to get us to that point? Thank you. Jen? Um, yeah, so actually I would sort of answer both questions. So the reason that we don't have such a large hydrogen network is because it's not decarbonised at the moment. So there would be little realistic point in changing it from one fossil fuel to another which is the current system for creating hydrogen and in terms of net zero at the question being when we have to either do one of two things we either have to get ccus as a realistic option for creating hydrogen at the moment now there's bits going on in different parts of the country cadent are doing some really good work on this but that's not a reality at the moment. We're still quite far from that. So we have to improve electrolysis and its relationship with the rest of the power system. So we have to look at doing that. And that's why in my opening comments, the need to create the markets for green hydrogen production for industry that we, where we use hydrogen now. Because if we don't at least change that, then we're trying to create hydrogen for a market that doesn't yet exist. So we have to do that first and encourage those hydrogen production areas to change into something else. Thank you. James? Um, so on the last one, when does, net z when does uh, zero carbon hydrogen become viable? I mean, uh, as soon as possible. I think there's lots of innovation going on that is very impressive. Um, and you know, the, the, the sooner, the better, um, because it is an obvious Achilles heel when you're talking about something. You're trying to prove the concept with a fuel or a gas that's actually been quite carbon intensive to produce in the first place. And, it's an obvious failing. Um, when I say that the UK has the opportunity to lead, I'm perfectly aware that there are, car, you know, there are hydrogen trains running in Germany, there are hydrogen fuel cell cars running, and that there are even hydrogen filling centres. There are hydrogen fuel um, filling centres in the UK. What I think we need to be the first to prove is the sort of the, the hydrogen economy at scale. That whole process of Product, producing the hydrogen, can carbon capture and storage be a part of it, how it can benefit heavy industry, how we get it around within a network, how we spin that off into domestic users, and if we can prove, if we can prove that at scale, I, I'm ready to be corrected, but in all the reading I've done and in the endless sessions like this that I've been in, I've not yet heard of anywhere in the world where at scale that sort of integrated hydrogen-based system is yet proven and, and working. So that's what I'm talking about because I think that's the real prize. Um, and so I, I'm with you, by the way. I have two, I evangelize about EVs and all things clean all the time. And yet my wife and I both drive diesel cars because like so many people, we thought we were doing the right thing when we bought them five, three, four, five years ago. Um, and we've got to be really careful. You know, look, we're coming up to a budget, the parliamentary party, what is it really revving up over? 
freezing fuel duty. I don't think the Chancellor's going to do that this time. But, but you know, so there's this whole thing, motoring costs is a really sensitive electoral issue that will torpedo all of this debate because that is the bit that the Sun and the Daily Mail quite rightly pick up on because that's what consumers really care about. Um, now, whether the answer for you is a longer range EVs, EV and those are coming or whether it is a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is, is for you to choose. But I think that we, I, I was very relaxed when in the road to zero, Chris and, and Greg didn't set a target, an earlier target, for the end of being able to sell petrol and diesel cars. You only need to start banning stuff if you're not certain that the technology is going to win through on its own merits. I think that EVs and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are exactly like these things, that the more and more people see of them, the more and more people are going to realise that they are just the cheaper way of going about your business and that people will be wanting to buy these things much more quickly than any line that government might arbitrarily draw in the sand at which point to ban them. Um, I just think this is going to win through and we'll get there very quickly indeed. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in? Just one point I was going to make. Uh, we, uh, the, the performance comparator we have for our hydrogen product is a diesel train. When compared to a diesel train, brown hydrogen is cleaner. Okay. But less efficient. In the, yeah. in the overall carbon emissions, though, are less. Okay. Um, we've got time for two more questions. So I'll take the gentleman there and the gentleman at the back with the red tie. Name and organisation, please. Hi. Uh, Dan Saunders, Octopus Group. Um, we're investing in clean transportation for large operators. A specific question uh, around heavy road transport. We're, we're dealing with the operators that come to us and predominantly, if you use an example of a bus operator, they always bring us fleets of electric buses. They're never hydrogen bus fleets. And the reason being is, quite simply, the cost of a hydrogen bus is two to three times that of an electric bus. It, it just doesn't work for their fleets. We're seeing similar with other heavy goods vehicles. And therefore, my question is, does there need to be something done to support the scaling up of these hydrogen vehicles in their development so they can compete with the, the battery companies that are really and and coming in at a much lower price point there you go thank you um i'll say one quick thing which is one of the key recommendations in our report was a uh, innovation grants for hydrogen buses in certain cities so like you said the, the cost is extraordinarily high but the, the life cycle cost over five years is, is comparable to that of a diesel bus if you got the upfront grant initially so i certainly think that is where government could play a role, but I'll open that up to the, the panels if they've got anything else to add, or I'll take the next question, um, in which case, oh, Mike, go on. Well, I'm just going to say, I mean, I think it's um, any form of, of support on, on product, the, the product cost almost invariably when you introduce a new technology is higher than the existing well-proven and long-developed option. So yeah, it, it's always going to be that initial barrier. Um, spend a lot of time looking at the bus side of things as well as as well as rail because it's there's analogies to be drawn but it is that challenge of of, of getting to the point where you've got sufficient volume of demand to make uh, bring the product price down and that's you know that's where the chinese are, are dominating in the battery market because they've now um realized that, that if they build enough of them and they and they do they can start to get the price down versus the rest of the world and the competition um when that volume it's chicken and egg. When the volume exists, the fuel cells, the other components that drive up the cost will come down. Thank you. Hyd hydrogen isn't turned to it isn't owed a living either. I mean, you know, if if companies are bring if bus companies or haulage companies are bringing forwards to you proposals for fleets of electric buses or whatever, because that is what is they can see a cost-effective business model there that they can't see for hydrogen. Well, I, I'm not sure that we should be sort of worrying about that. That's just a business fact of life. Go on, sorry. Where the electric range on buses isn't enough, but hydrogen is just not cost effective. So the, the default is to stay with Euro 6 and it's not getting us to where we need to be. So therefore, there needs to be that intervention to really help people say, right, we, we have an option. We can move to a higher density 
energy fuel, hydrogen. Um, and, and okay, maybe you're right, it isn't a mode of living, but it certainly needs a helping hand to at least get comparable. Yeah, can I just... Uh, yes, uh, so, and I'd, I'd agree with you there, because you can... And when it comes to Euro 6, the internal combustion engine, that's really actually very clean, so um, it's not such a bad thing. Uh, when you talk about an electric bus, all I just think is it must be so heavy. That's all, all I can think. And one of the things that often doesn't change with electric vehicles is the types of tyres and brake pads and things that are used around them. So they're actually quite heavily polluting as well because they give off more dust because they're not created in the right way. Um, so when it comes to hydrogen, it's definitely probably the best fuel if it, you're not using diesel for buses. So there needs to be some way that if the government is going to step in, that it steps in and looks at the appropriate engineering for what we're trying to achieve. If it's just cheap to make batteries and you end up with a fleet of, of battery vehicles that aren't good for the purpose you want them for, there's, there's no point in doing that and people shouldn't really be proposing that that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Can I just add one, 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 yes. one thing here? I think we need to be mindful of is that we, the electricity comes out of the plug. That's fine. Um, some of our biggest increase in demands is short-term gas-fired power generation coming on our networks, giving us even bigger challenges. So, you know, where does it come from? We do need to look as a UK about the whole life. I'm not saying hydrogen has to be the answer, but if you just push it back on the gas grid, you know, we'll just keep supplying gas to people who are generating at peak times and we're still burning fossil fuel somewhere. Thank you. Finally, last question. We've only got, well, no minutes remaining, so keep it brief. Thank you. Howard Ward, Winchester Constituency, Energy Services Director of Watertel UK Limited. Uh, my, I have some questions over the energy equations of this, really, and I'm not entirely sure that I fully understand where you're coming from on this, and would very much like your comments. When you actually do the cracking of something like methane, or, or indeed any other hydrocarbon, it's very energy intensive to do that, and so you're using a lot of energy, one, to do that. Secondly, you're going to be using quite a lot of energy to then get rid of that CO2, get it down there. And finally, you're producing this product, hydrogen, that has rather lower calorific value than the things that you started off with in the first place. So I'm not sure how these things really add up effectively on that. One other quick point to make to James on this one is there. You said you've got a, an issue here on selling it to the general public. And I fully agree with that. That's absolutely right. Uh, when you talk to the man in the street and to say hydrogen and the transport, fairly or unfairly, and actually very unfairly, the first thing that comes into his mind is probably the Hindenburg, you know, so he's going to go to total flat spin panic. So you need to sell it, and let's face it, over the last 20 years, we haven't even been very effective at selling conservative policies and conservative ideas. <laughs> We've been lousy, so, you know, get onto your marketing course, please. Thank you. Who wants to answer the question on... Uh, mathematics. Yeah, you're an engineer, I, yeah it's fine. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The energy balance is off at the moment, and that's that's completely fair comment. And the reason for that is that we're not looking at it as a fuel necessarily to have the same energetic value as the others. We're looking to decarbonize. So we have to look at a way to remove that carbon dioxide. But if you start to look at the opportunities, particularly between the nuclear industry and electrolysis, we have a chance to start to make hydrogen in a much more efficient way. But what we use it for thereafter is another question. I'd also say that if you get right back to energy physics, there's loads of energy in the world. It's just a case of how you get hold of it and how you use it to make something else. So the fact that you might use more on one side to get something out of the other end, it doesn't actually matter so long as you're using it in the appropriate way and it's a sustainable way of doing it. Thank you. I think the last thing that we would say from Caden is that we've modelled our networks, we have sophisticated computer modelling to make sure we provide you with enough energy, we've run those networks with the CV of hydrogen and we would have to do a small amount of reinforcement but the, the bulk of our network, 99%, will be just fine. All right. Thank you very much. So big thank you to Caden and a big thank you to yourselves for attending. Round of applause please.